While all before that was going on, we just told you that District Attorney Anne-Marie Schubert had been talking for about 80 or so minutes, and uh, one of our legal experts, Mark Reichel, is in studio with Sinceri Tonsil, and he was saying, Mark, that this is uh, her closing argument. She laid out this uh, long plan. Sinceri, take it away. Definitely. That's something that we've been talking about when all of this got started, the deep, deep background that she went into to start this presentation. As uh, Eric said, you called it a closing argument. There's not going to be a trial in this case, given what she's just decided that no criminal charges will be brought. So why start that way? It was, And also the problem is it's a little one-sided. And I think that's fundamentally the problem with all of this. Um, studies, there's recent studies, specifically the Pew Institute did a great study in 2017 that really took all segments of American society and asked questions about police misconduct and police, actually, police killing of, of young Africans. African-American men, actually. And the one thing that was constant was everyone felt that there was no real accountability thereafter. Mm -hmm. Just about every American felt that, in a, in a way, the police can get away with things. Now, obviously, the feelings of that changed dramatically with demographics. So in, in, in different races and different demographic areas, they really believe that the police can get away with anything. They don't think their actions are motivated by racism or any, uh, anything else like that. It's just that they think uh, the police feel that they can get away with anything. So as a result, accountability is really something that really gnaws at people. And in the legislature last year was AB 931, mm -hmm. which was co-sponsored by Sacramento's uh, Kevin McCarty, actually. And 931 changed the law, was going to change the law. It got shelved and was never signed by the governor. But it's exactly about what the DA was talking about. She said, we follow a jury instruction. We right. follow the law. This was to change the law. It was to change it in, in three really significant ways. One, it was going to require the officers to look at time, distance, communications, and available resources to always de-escalate a situation, and then changing from reasonable to necessary. So the use of deadly force, mm -hmm. if it's reasonable, they get a free pass. They were going to change the law to make it necessary. And, to change and that's it, a different standard, a much different much standard. Much different standard. And to change it as well, it now says to prevent harm. This says to defend against harm. So there has to be actual harm coming, not just to prevent it, which is a very vague and ambiguous statement. So those changes would have been absolutely significant. It did die in the legislature. It mm -hmm. got shelved. And I guarantee you, every law enforcement group, I am positive that the DA's association, including probably the Sacramento County DA's office, adamantly opposed uh, 931. It'll be coming up again in this legislative session. It seems to me to be almost the answer to these issues because people think accountability is the problem, not the motivation by the officers, but just that they think they can get away with it. Talking about motivation, I have to go to something that that we just heard from Stephon Clark's mother. We also heard some of our colleagues ask this of the DA directly at the end of her presentation. We got a lot of deep detail about the cell phone records, the texts, and the conversations that Stephon Clark was having 48 hours prior to this incident with police where he was shot and killed. And a lot of people in the community online already are asking, what does that have to do with the moment when officers were having this encounter and, and chose to fire their weapons at him multiple times. What's your assessment of bringing that up? We also heard uh, D.A. Schubert question about the fact, did you look at what was in the cell phone records of the officers 48 hours ahead of time? It's what people need to understand that actually a uh, trial work, unfortunately, is not science. It's persuasion. It really is persuasion. And often we say, look, if they're not going to like my case, I want them to dislike the other person. Mm. So as a result, you come out and you you talk about how he was using drugs and so forth. You put him at desperate. You put him with all these problems going on. You paint him as violent. And it, what you're trying to do is get the viewer and the hearer to think, hmm, this is not exactly, you know, an altar boy or someone that's, you know, the greatest person and so forth. So that's done for a reason. And then when the question is asked, well, are you saying this is suicide by cop? That, that's not for me to say. Then what is the relevance of it? What is the relevance? Why do you put it out there if it's not relevant? I'll tell you why. Because there's, there's a flaw to that. Number one, obviously, the officers didn't know that. But secondly, if this individual is truly, truly suicidal, and he's in that situation, you run at the cops screaming and yelling. Right. You pretend that you have a gun. Here, they're in control. They're in control. And they get there, and their commands couldn't be more conflicting. Did anyone say, stop, stay where you are? They said, put your hands up and basically surrender. And he, the, the young man is coming very slowly, very slowly, apparently with his hands up. So if you've got your hands up and you're trying to surrender... You know, they asked her then, well, how do you know he wasn't surrendering? And she acted like that had never been a question that came up. She was like, well, there's no evidence that he was surrendering. Well, if he was committing suicide, he'd scream really loud 
to make them afraid and make them want to just pop off as many as they could. So, you know, the fact that they didn't then look at the text messages and the cell phone of the two officers and to also ask, act like no one would ask that question. Well, who's going to ask the, the, the look of you know, like confusion of why would you ask me such mm -hmm. a question? If those officers had said text messages in there that were could clear, clearly be interpreted as you know having animus and having anger and being in a bad mood or using drugs that day, they, why wouldn't you look at that? What's I mean, and to say that that's a crazy question. You don't need to be a lawyer to ask that question. Just everyone wants to know that question. And the way then she had to look to someone. They said, "Were they tested for drugs or alcohol?" She looked like you know that person had three heads. And she had to look over to someone. And said, "Oh no, he didn't." And so it, to me, also the uh, the whole thing about them not doing an independent interview of the officers and just taking the interview from the Sacramento Police, the agency that employs these officers that are under investigation. Does that seem yes. normal to you? For, for a long time, there's also been calls for an independent branch of, of the government that will investigate and prosecute police misconduct cases and police shootings. And here's why. That DA has to be reelected by the support of law enforcement. That DA has to it depends on her successes in her trials with law enforcement. They're, they work hand in glove. They have to get along. And so as a result, even the judges that are there to hear these type of cases and when it's a police misconduct case, they see them every day. They, you know, this is familiarity. We know each other. We work together every day. If there's a separate system of DAs and prosecutors and investigators that do police misconduct and have nothing to do with the rest of the system, they wouldn't be subject to that type of bias or influence. They would be just doing their job. They're not on the same bowling team. They're not good friends with. They don't see them every day to try to make their cases successful, to win their cases, to make their job easier. Instead, if it's completely separate and they never do criminal cases with those people, that's the best way to do this. There's been calls for that for a long time. It just always gets stopped in the legislature. We are hearing that in about 10 minutes, we are going to get some comment from the mayor of Sacramento, Daryl Steinberg. Now, during his State of the City address, he was very empathetic, took this address that's never been outside of downtown to the neighborhood where this killing happened, talked about some programs that will benefit children who might have grown up like Stephon Clark in that very area. The city is also being sued civilly by this family. So now that we have this decision from the DA about criminal charges, the mayor has to speak very carefully when he comes out about this, doesn't he? Absolutely, but it's also endemic. It's also what's in the system. It's always been this way that they figure, well, we won't criminally charge and we'll let them sue for money. And it's a way of feeling better and also hoping that it alleviates the problem. I think the problem is people don't want the money anymore. They don't care about the big verdicts. It's where the money comes from. They understand it's their own tax dollars. That's not what people want anymore. I think what they really want is what they believe is fairness, that these individuals don't get a pass, that if you know the common person does something, they're judged one way, but police officers can do something and be judged a different way. And there's a large number of people that understand these civil awards are always the default position, and it's always the salve to make the populace feel better. But in reality, there's a lot of people that say, we don't want that anymore. We actually we, we want them to join the criminal prosecution uh, you know, system exactly as everyone else. And that seems to be the big difference. For the fact that no charges were brought or found appropriate by the DA today, and then also as it plays into the civil case, we did hear several times from District Attorney Schubert that the video doesn't show Stephon Clark with anything in his hands. So if in the beginning, we're looking at somebody running, albeit through backyards and maybe away from a patio glass door that had been smashed, that he might have smashed, but doesn't have anything in his hands. And then later officers are saying, oh, but he was holding this gun, mm -hmm. according to the investigation that they've you know, completed now. How does that play later on? Where did that suddenly come from? Well, in the civil case, it's going to be a lower standard, obviously. In a criminal case, they have to prove that the officers are guilty of a crime beyond a reasonable doubt, which is a high standard. In a civil case, it's a preponderance of the evidence. That means one side has just one drop of more evidence than the other side. And I think we all know this case is going to settle. There's no one who thinks this case is going to end up in trial. And when it goes through the civil civil case, though, actually, there's depositions, there's discovery, there's interrogatories, there's subpoenas they can issue, both sides, but obviously it's going to be on Stefan Clark's side, that they're going to want to get all sorts of information about prior shootings, about prior training, about whether or not they were offered this training under this new AB 30, 931 approach. All of that stuff and whether or not that was discarded and so forth. And so as a result, I think it's going to be in the city's interest and it's going to settle and they're going to pay a decent amount of money 
And in a way, that makes the DA's office always feel better. Like, okay, well, there's some justice going to this for poor family. And that's, like I said, been the default forever. Uh, Daryl Steinberg has a tiger to try to handle. Uh, I don't think you know anyone thinks he's a bad person. He's a very compassionate and progressive leader for the city. A very intelligent man as well, and very experienced in politics. But this is something you would not wish on any politician to try to ride this tiger. And it's the DA's office is lucky because they're smaller. They're limited. They can just say, "Okay, we did our job." Now this is out, our scope. We're out of here. Bye. But in reality, to also say I'm a member of the community, I'm an elected official, and so forth and so on, to be part of an overall community. Uh, you know, this great village that's arising that is Sacramento, mm -hmm. to then say, I'm out of here and let Mr. Steinberg deal with the problems. Uh, I wish it wasn't that way. And there's right. a lot of ways this could have been handled better. And I think the takeaway from this is the absolute surprise on her face when people said, well, did you check the officer's cell phones as well? Because you just spent some time really massacring this kid's character and so forth and painting him as a wild kid or whatever. And then when the look was like, why would we do that? That makes people think, again, it's this double standard. Mark, I want to thank you for your insight. We are just getting some new contact with Stephon Clark's family. We are going to hear now from his mother. And there we were just listening to members of Stephon Clark's family. We heard from his mother. We also heard from um, a young woman that is a close friend of the family that we have seen over and over yes. again with Stevante over the last year, Jamelia Land. Um, she mentioned a word that we were just talking about, accountability. You said accountability, 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 and that people are looking for that. People who unfortunately find themselves in this kind of situation, looking at the police department pledge to protect them and looking at them as, as they've been victimized instead and looking for someone to say, what's going on here? Will these people who hurt my loved one be charged and that's exactly what she just she just brought yeah. up it's not like we rehearsed this obviously but l like I'm saying accountability is everyone thinks there's no accountability and what you just saw was exhibit a to um, the common person the average person thinking there's no accountability she also then immediately went to accountability and said you know AB 392 which is the new version of last year's 931 so even she's aware you know of 392 and, and that change needs to be made in the legislature because you're never going to get accountability from what you just saw at that press conference. We've heard a lot from friends of Stefan. We've heard a lot from relatives over the last year. We have a civil case that's sitting out there um, and the family today for perhaps a lot of reasons, obviously a very emotional day to finally have this weighty decision that everyone has been physically waiting on for almost a year. Um, not saying a lot, saying that there weren't going to be marches and protests and what have you. Um, do you think that's hinging on the fact that a civil attorney probably said, try to keep the comments trim? Yes, they've hired, I mean, Ben Crump is their lawyer. Mm -hmm. I think he's become nationally probably the best lawyer for this in America. He has taken on that crown. I really think that. He t has them all across the country. He's a really... We've had him here and okay. spoken to him oh, about ben it. Ben Crump yes. is really the man now. I think he's the person. And, of course, they're going to listen to him because they know, you know, they know. And Ben Crump is telling them everything they say can be used or twisted or something in a different way. So as a result, you know, they have, they have everything they need in their lawsuit. They don't need the family to make another statement publicly. The pa family made a lot of statements publicly, understandable statements. They don't need it anymore, so Ben Crump is going to put an end to that. Um, looking over the presentation, the closing argument, as you called it, that D.A. Schubert put out there, anything else that stands out to you? We talked about the, the cell phone data from 48 hours back that just seems to be causing a lot of question for people. Anything else, the way this was laid out, that seems odd to you? A couple of things. One is that the, the closing argument went great for her, mm -hmm. and it was rehearsed, and it was, you know, had a PowerPoint. But then when questions came from the jurors, and that's really what it was like, when questions came from the jurors, the posture, the body positioning, everything, the, the cadence, the way she answered questions became very combative, very uncomfortable. And that was rather significant. It was almost like cross-examination from the public about what you just said, whether it's true or not. Additionally, you know, the, the Attorney General of California spent a lot of time with a lot of resources on the AG's report. So Javier Becerra, our Attorney General, gave them a 90-page report on this. Exactly. Yeah, it has 49 suggestions, which are all these great suggestions about what to do in the future and what to use in evaluating this. No mention of that. And that's the Attorney General of California who came in conflict-free, Conflict-free, not from Sacramento, but representing the entire state. And Mr. Becerra's um, recommendations and report weren't even discussed. 
So those are two things that were a little bit to me uh, from a policy standpoint, not as a juror, because I think this was intended to persuade you. And if it's not going to persuade you, we're not going to bring it up. And the problem is, is the media was there and they brought these things up that stopped persuading us and she got uncomfortable. Um, looking over what has gone on in this city over the last year, there's been a lot of unrest, a lot of unrest on the streets. The way this was handled today, the way the closing argument was presented, do you think this provides enough answers to mm. people? That's the problem. And, I, and I'm not going to critique the DA's presentation. I know what she wanted to do. She wanted to say, we're not going to file charges based on the facts and the law that we have. And I, I understand that. I think some people may, have, may see it as a little overreaching, a little disingenuous, because, specifically because of what the media did when they said, did you check the cell phones of the officers and to... If, You're if, not blaming the media. <laughs> no. I mean, I think what they did was they exposed, they asked the question that people wanted asked very clearly about accountability. And if there had been an answer, which is there's a state law or a policy that prevents us from, from looking at officers' that. phones, but instead to say, well, that makes no sense, what are you talking about? That, I think, if you ask me, blew away and, and erased everything she had said earlier, because then it looks like a biased speaker giving a message. And I think that was the big fatal error, if you ask me, on the presentation and the persuasion. Going ahead and looking at the plans for a possible law change, given that it didn't pass last year, are we, now that we have this decision, do you think that that's enough momentum to get something changed? I do. Or that the, you do? I, I mean, you heard the family spokesperson say, look, what we had just said, she said, look, 392 is there, go support it. Um, it channels this anger, it channels our feeling of injustice. It gives us an outlet, it gives an exact place for us to put our you know, anger and injustice to put it in. And that's 392 and the legislature. Uh, I think that it's gonna pass. And I think this governor is gonna sign it. And I think it is gonna change things. Stefan Clark's death may end up you know, changing, changing how law enforcement interacts with people in deadly force situations. Forever. We've had a lot of changes already out of this case, the way the body cams are used and making sure the audio is on, reviewing the foot pursuit procedure. So there are already incremental changes happening within agencies and now maybe a change with the law. Immediately. Daniel Hahn, the, chief, the police chief, immediately changed some of the rules about turning it off for the audio afterwards. As soon as he saw the video in this case and the audio, he changed things. And you're right, the legislature has new laws about transparency and, you know, Transparency, it goes hand in hand, it's married to accountability. Mm -hmm. It's married to accountability. And it always is known that when there's no information, it's chased by misinformation. So give information and there won't be misinformation.